and today's Bible reading is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought nearby by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Uh, let me tell you about myself and why this particular passage uh, resonates with me. I didn't grow up a Christian. I didn't uh, grow up in a Christian home. Uh, my father is, a, a Scot is, is Scottish. He's uh, from Scotland. He's a a staunch Presbyterian, and in, in what he thinks is good Presbyterian form, never misses any hatchings, matchings, and dispatchings at a church, and uh, is never there for anything else. He's a good, solid Freemason. My mother is, uh, uh, side is Jewish, so of course we grew up Catholic. Uh, uh, and um, my, uh, my older brother is a Reformed Jew. He's chairman of his synagogue in Cape Town in South Africa. My, uh, my younger brother is Orthodox Jew, quite fanatically Orthodox Jewish. Uh, he, he lives in, in the capital of Israel, New York, and he, he's, um, he's quite strongly um, fanatical about his Judaism. And in between those two brothers is me, the Bible-bashing bishop uh, from <laughs> South Africa. Uh, so it's quite a variety of uh, religious backgrounds in our home. And for me, um, coming to Christ in my early 20s, uh, I met a, a, a non-Jewish girl. We, um, we decided to get married. We kind of flipped a coin between cathedrals and synagogues and churches. We ended up at her parents' church, which happened to be a Christian church preaching the gospel, much like here. And when I was about 23 years old, I first heard the gospel uh, in the church, and, um, and everything fell into place, uh, and I came to Christ. Now, one of the things that really struck me uh, in doing that was, especially hearing from my Jewish side of the family that I was betraying the faith. Actually, when I started reading the scriptures, uh, the struggle was the other way around. Uh, in the early church, uh, the believers were Jewish, and it took them quite a while to come to terms with the fact uh, that Jesus was for the Gentiles too. And uh, there was a number of years of struggle in the, in the first century of the church before they really kind of opened the door and said, okay, the Gentiles can come to you. But you've got to understand, that's a struggle for us Jews. I mean, really? We're giving you our Messiah for free? Are you crazy? Uh, so, so it took a little while for us to come to terms with that. You have to understand. And uh, contrary to the way Jewish people think about Christianity today, where they say it's not for Jews, it was actually very much the other way around in the first century where um, Jewish believers in Jesus had to come to terms with the fact that Jesus was for Gentiles too. And what Paul says in this great chapter is that the Israel phase was part of the plan for Jesus to go to all of the nations, and that Israel was kind of like the scale model of what God's people were going to look like uh, across the planet uh, once the Messiah Jesus came. And... Uh, that aspect of the gospel is very important in how we understand how we live out our Christian life. Uh, in my early years as a Christian, a lot of my evangelizing 
and sharing the gospel was very much on this aspect, this horizontal, uh, uh, this vertical aspect uh, of Christianity, my relationship with God and what Jesus has done to secure that relationship, which is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. Um, but the other aspect is, is, is important too, and that's the horizontal aspect, which is Ephesians 2, from the 11 to 22, where it's not just this relationship that's restored, but also this one. Uh, and they are and they are inseparable, actually, and that's what Paul unpacks here in Ephesians chapter two, um, and particularly here uh, in this second section of the chapter, where he talks about this this uh, horizontal aspect uh, of the gospel and what Jesus does, not just in saving us into relationship with God, but also with each other, and particularly this barrier that stood between Jewish and Gentile believer. Uh, in the first century. And here are three things that Christ does as he takes us, uh, first of all, from exclusion to inclusion. Verse 11, therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. This kind of language is very much the language Jewish people used in that first century when they referred to Gentiles, and Gentiles are people who are not Jews, which is probably most people here today, uh, non-Jews, were called Gentiles. And when Jews referred to them, they referred to them as uncircumcised. It's like, ugh, ugh, uncircumcised, you know, puff, don't touch them, uh, unclean. And that kind of derogatory language is uh, what Paul is referring to here, that uh, the Jews called you guys uncircumcised, uh, remember, you guys, the non-Jews, verse 12, uh, at that time were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. He's saying this is what the non-Jewish nations were like. This is what non-Jewish people were like. This is what you were. You were excluded um, from this relationship with God and his people. Uh, there's five aspects of it there uh, in, in verse 12 that uh, the non-Jew was separate from Christ, verse, tw verse, verse 12. <clears throat> In other words, no possibility of a savior, no possibility of a Messiah for the Gentiles, for the non-Jews. Excluded from citizenship in Israel. He's talking to a Gentile audience. He's talking to a, a non-Jewish audience and telling them many of these uh, people hearing this letter would have been Roman citizens. The great Roman Empire at the time dominated the world. Having Roman citizenship was considered to be quite a privilege. And yet he says to them, you're excluded from heavenly citizenship because you're not Jewish. And you're foreigners, thirdly, to the covenants of the promise. That's the Old Testament promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and without hope, that's eternal hope. And without God in the world, fifthly. Uh, without God is where we get the English word atheist from, atheos. Really means without God, not that you don't believe in God, but you don't have God, which means there's a lot more atheists in the world than they realize. Um, that's what, that's what non-Jews were like in Old Testament times, in pre-Jesus times, excluded from all of these privileges uh, that were given to God's people, Israel. And Paul says that has changed, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And again, this is Jewish language, uh, taken from the book of Isaiah, far away referred to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, brought near referred to the Israelites, the Jews, who, um, who were brought near to God as he rescued them from Egypt into a relationship with himself. Paul says that has all changed now that Jesus has come. You've brought, you non-Jews have been brought near to God too. How? Verse 13, by the blood of Christ. And by the blood of Christ, refers always in the New Testament to the death of Christ. Christ's death on the cross for our sins brings us near to God as we come to faith in him. Being in Jesus, verse 13, means you get all the privileges that were once just given to Israel. An eternal king, a Messiah, a royal citizenship, a heavenly country, a certain hope of eternal life and a true and living God. And that was, a huge, uh, that was a huge truth for these Roman citizens to come to terms with, being excluded from the real privilege uh, that was given only to the Jews until Jesus came. 
you guys live in a beautiful country, I'm sure you've noticed. Um, uh, I'm not surprised so many people want to come and live here. Uh, I've discovered that I'm a unique person in this country. I'm a South African with a return ticket. <laughs> uh, there's not many of us around here, I've discovered. Um, and I can see why this is the most magnificent place. And to, have, to be a citizen of this country is a wonderful privilege and, a great, and, 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 and envied by many others. And yet, that citizenship for all of you will end one day. It'll end at the grave. It doesn't carry on after that. Some of you seem shocked. <laughs> it's going to end. But the citizenship that Jesus gives to Jew and non-Jew alike is eternal. This is a heavenly citizenship that goes beyond the grave. And for these Roman citizens who've prized their Roman citizenship so much, this was way beyond anything that they could treasure at an earthly level. Jesus, by his kindness, offers this inclusion to all non-Jews around the world. Jesus takes us from exclusion to inclusion. Jesus takes us, secondly, from hostility to peace. Um, I'm from South Africa. We know something about hostility. We uh, have a history of it. In case you didn't know, maybe you um, uh, are younger than me, but our country has a long history of hostility and division. Um, <clears throat> in the early 1990s, uh, our country was on the brink of civil war, uh, and really it was a, a powder keg waiting to explode. Um, my wife and I had just come to know Jesus. We'd just come to faith in Jesus and were enjoying this new Christian life uh, and sitting in a church uh, very much like yours when uh, just a few weeks after we'd become Christians, we experienced something of the hostility and anger and hatred in our country as terrorists burst into our church, threw hand grenades at us and opened fire at us with AK-47 machine guns, killed about a dozen people. Uh, in our church. We felt that firsthand, that kind of hostility. And it really felt as if the country was going to go up in flames in the early 1990s. And, and, and then this miracle happened, uh, which it, it, obviously in God's plan was his kindness to us. And Nelson Mandela, who was the leader at the time, and many of you may have heard of him, um, brought about this incredible unity. He just had this, this away about him that uh, those of us on both sides felt in the most incredible way. And we had, this, we had this magnificent time of unity in the early 1990s as we all voted together and there was a great reconciliation. It was an amazing time. Uh, um, Clint Eastwood made a movie about it, Invictus. Do you remember that movie? So you Australians didn't come off too well in that movie, but well, it was for a greater cause, wasn't it? The Rugby World Cup I'm referring to. Um, <clears throat> but that time has moved on, and a, a lot of the shine has faded, and of course the old hostilities and fights and tensions have come back. Because none of those things will really last. And in any country and in any era, it's the same story. And as noble a, a, an effort that the United Nations may make and other people, um, those things will only be temporary. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. And there's two reasons why the, the harmony doesn't last. One is we don't realize the extent of the sin that's in our own hearts, which is the, the biggest problem in the world is us, is me. And the, and the other thing is we look for peace in the wrong place. You see verse 14? Verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace. He's not talking about a constitution or a political system, um, or, or, a, or an ideology, uh, or a movement. He's, he's talking about a person. And not just any person, not a guru, or a statesman, uh, or some great leader. He's talking about a unique person, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He himself is our peace, because he himself verse 14 goes on to say, has made the two groups one, Jew and non-Jew, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Again, this is Jewish temple language. In the first century, the temple stood in the center of Jerusalem, and the temple was the central focus for Jewish religion. 
And in that temple, um, th there were divisions. Uh, this is an overhead diagram. The yellow part is the actual temple. And inside the temple, the, the center of the yellow part was where the high priest was allowed to enter once a year, and only the high priest. And then other priests could go into the yellow part, into the pink part, um, and Jewish women could go into the green part and only into the green part. And, and Jewish men and women were allowed into the inner courts. Um, and Gentiles, or non-Jews, were allowed into the outer yellow part. And there was a wall between the Jews and the Gentiles that separated them. And on that wall were actually written no trespassing signs. Um, I took a photo of one when I was in Israel a few months ago. This is at the Jerusalem Museum. This is the actual stone that's been recovered from the archaeological digs. Uh, and on the stone was written in Greek so that the non-Jews could read it. Basically, it said, no foreigner shall enter here or we'll kill you. It's kind of like an extreme no trespassing sign, you know? Uh, and that's what they had there. Um, and this is what Paul is referring to here uh, in this verse. What Jesus has done is he's broken that barrier down. Now, that wall was still standing when Paul wrote this letter. But this is a barrier that that wall symbolized. This barrier that separated the Jew from the non-Jew. The barrier that separated God's people from the nations. And what Jesus has done is he set it aside. He set aside the law with its commands and regulations, verse 15 says. In other words, all of the things that erected the barrier in the first place, our sin, our rebellion against God, our hostility towards God and one another, Jesus has broken that down by taking it in himself to the cross. He's put it to death and therefore put to death whatever hostility remains between us and God and between each other. And will you notice as well that this applies to Jew and non-Jew? How are Gentiles or non-Jews reconciled to God? Through the cross of Jesus. How are Jews reconciled to God? Through the cross of Jesus. There's not two ways here. I often find this with people who, who, want to, who think that Jews have some sort of special path to heaven. The path to heaven is, for, is the same for everyone. It's through the cross of Jesus. Uh, because our God saves by grace and not by race, as they say. Verse 18, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We both find God the same way, through faith in Jesus. And it's Jesus who takes us, when we come to faith in him, Jew and Gentile, into his family. Thirdly and lastly, he takes us from foreigners to family. So verse 19 says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Three images there of this new family, fellow citizens, he says. We're fellow citizens, Jew and non-Jew, in Christ Jesus. Uh, we are members of God's household. That is a royal family, and we are part of his holy temple. Not that building uh, in Jerusalem, but a living, growing entity, an organism of Jew and Gentile believer in Jesus, growing together in him. It's a living thing. And that's the picture that Paul builds for these Ephesians to see what they have now uh, through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, who has come for all the nations and who has come to bring an end to the hostility that exists, and not just between Jew and Gentile, but between many groups that find themselves divided against one another. It's, it's hard to talk about this in theory, but in, in, in practice, the power of the gospel is seen in lots of different ways like this, and is actually a great a demonstration to the world of what the gospel can accomplish between us and God. The most extreme example, of course, that I can think of and that I've experienced um, is, is in Israel today. Um, I've, I've been over to Israel a couple of times in the last few months, uh, once for a Christian conference and once for a bar mitzvah, go <laughs> figure. And um, um, <clears throat> the one time I met up with a, um, an American missionary working for, with Syrian refugees in Jordan. Um, and I got him, because he could speak Arabic, he was a young man, to take me across uh, from Jerusalem into the West Bank. 
um, to visit somebody that he'd been telling me about. And um, we had to cross the modern day dividing wall of hostility, which of course is the border between the West Bank and, uh, and Israel. And this is the crossing point. Everything's very tense there. Um, crossed over into uh, the West Bank, went to a little village near Bethlehem, uh, down a little alley here, and we ducked down a little side street, walked quite far uh, into a little village on the outskirts uh, of Bethlehem, and met this man who's in the middle of the picture over there walking, uh, who told me the most incredible story. I had a fantastic day with him. Let me just tell you quickly that meeting that man <coughs> it was quite scary and nearly cost me my life um, because in that village uh, there's a little border crossing at the, on the outskirts of the village into Israel and some crazy Palestinian angry man charged the border post that afternoon and I took a screen grab from the news site um, and they shot him but he, he's alive, he survived. Um, just a couple of hours after this incident my translator and I came walking down that very pavement uh, and I was in quite a hurry to get to the border post because it was late, it was getting dark, I wanted to get a taxi back to Jerusalem um, and uh, I was getting a bit agitated, I had a bit of a conversation with one of the taxi drivers who was trying to rip us off and I said let's just, just get out of here so <clears throat> I put my little day pack on and uh, I marched quite quickly, almost trotting towards the border post, thinking I need to get across before it's too late, running ahead of my translator on my own, looking a little bit Palestinian, I might add, uh, towards the border post. Now, I, just, I did not even think for a moment this would be a dangerous exercise. And then all, all of a sudden, those soldiers uh, came running at me uh, with their machine guns drawn and everything, shouting at me in Arabic, thinking I'm this, another crazy Palestinian suicide bomber. Um, and at first I'm thinking, who are they after? And it was me. And uh, my translator is behind me saying, Glenn, stop, they're going to shoot you. Put your hands up. They're saying they're going to shoot you. I don't know what they're saying. I put my hands up like this. I'm, tr I'm trying to use some Hebrew that I know, going, I'm glit, you know, I'm glit, which means I'm, I'm, an, I'm an Englishman, not an idiot. Although, I don't know, at the time, <laughs> they probably thought it was the same thing. I, I, and I, I'm standing there like this with the soldiers running at us. People were getting out the way thinking, there's going to be a shoot in here. And uh, I'm standing there like this thinking, Lord, I remember having this conversation with him so clearly. And I was bracing for the bullets to hit me. As a matter of fact, the young soldier, who was about 18 years old, was shaking afterwards. And he said to me, you have no idea how close I was shooting to you. I was going to shoot you. It was so close. I can't believe I didn't. And I'm standing there like this thinking, Lord, I know you've got a sense of humor, but... You know, a half-Jewish bishop from South Africa about to be shot in Palestine by the Israeli army. This is too much, you know. And, and it's a bit of an expense on my side if this is one of your jokes. Um, so anyway, a big tent standoff. But uh, there was a real feeling that there was some sort of spiritual opposition to what we were doing that day. Um, my translated lovely young man from America got a message from his wife. At the time, all of this tension was happening. Uh, and she said she just had a miscarriage. Um, there, was, there was this feeling that there was just this opposition to what we were doing as we went to go visit this Palestinian man and his family. And he took us to his home. He was so excited to meet, to meet us. He took us to his home. Um, he'd heard that this African bishop was coming to visit and everybody was waiting in the village for me to come. Um, and then they arrived and they were like, where's the African bishop? <laughs> and I'm like, it's me. And they were like... You're a bit light-skinned for an African bishop. Uh, and they couldn't get my name right. Uh, uh, apparently, Glenn is unpronounceable in Palestine. And um, I showed them a photograph of my son, whose name is Joseph. And I said, Yusuf, this is Yusuf. And they were like, oh, you are Abu Yusuf, father of Yusuf. And because every Palestinian names his son after him. And, um, and I'm a bishop. What's a bishop? It's kind of like a sheikh. So I'm Sheikh Abu Yusuf in Palestine. Uh, and if, if ever you go, just tell them you know Sheikh Abu Yusuf. They'll look after you, I promise you. It's amazing. And um, th this whole sensation happened as um, they met this African Sheikh Abu Yusuf um, who came to tell them about Jesus. Uh, and I really came to hear this man's story as we sat and they, they killed the fatted calf 
Middle Eastern hospitality, it is great. Really, everything they say about it is true. And we're sitting having this wonderful meal. All the family are there, Muslim and non-Muslim. Um, and uh, let's call him Abdul. Uh, <coughs> shares his story and he says, he says to me, I was an angry young Palestinian teenage, teenager. I hated the Jews. I hated every Israeli. I wanted them dead. And so Hamas recruited me and I joined them as a junior terrorist and started stockpiling weapons to attack the Israelis. And in the midst of plotting this attack and helping move weapons around and everything, I was caught uh, and, uh, by the Israelis and put in prison. And I lay in that prison bed, a 19-year-old angry young man crying out to God, why is this happening? Why me? And what's this all about anyway? Who's right in all of this? Are the Muslims right? Are the Jews right? Are the Christians right? And he lay in this prison cell crying and crying out to God. And he said that night he had this vivid dream where uh, he heard this voice to say, I will show you the way. Be at, be at peace, my son. I will show you the way. I've heard a lot of testimonies like this uh, from people in Arabic countries. And um, Soon after that, amazingly, he was released from prison, but banned for life from going into Israel or any Israeli-aligned country. And um, he went back to the village, went back to his father's shop, and was working in his father's shop. And he was sitting in his father's shop not long after this, and a missionary who was lost was trying to find directions back to wherever his compound was. And he walked down this little side street into the shop to ask for directions. And Abdul was sitting there looking at him. And of course, a Western face is unusual in this little village. And he looked at him and he said, are you going to tell me about Jesus? And the missionary went, uh, uh, no, <laughs> uh, I'm just looking for directions. But actually, I can tell you about Jesus. And so um, Abdul took him home to his family, laid on the Middle Eastern hospitality. Uh, and this missionary shared the gospel with him. And that day, Abdul got on his knees and came to Jesus and came to faith in Christ. Um, and now, Abdul, is, a, is he pastors a little church. There's that nine Palestinians that come uh, every week to hear him teach the Bible, and he disciples them in this little village um, with much opposition. Um, and while he was sharing this with me, he also asked me to share. I got to share the gospel with his Muslim family. I was thinking, Lord, only you can do this. This you know, half-Jewish bishop from South Africa sharing the gospel with these Muslim people in Palestine. It's just amazing that how God works. Uh, I never would have planned this. Um, I was planning to go to McDonald's that day. I wasn't planning to go to the West Bank. Um, and I shared, his wife got very emotional. It was, it was an amazing moment. And then he looked at me and he said, Glenn, you know, I hated the Jews. I hated every Israeli that I saw with a deadly hatred. And now that Jesus has come into my life, I love them. And I love their book, he said. I love their book. It was the most amazing day. And there we sat, I think I've got a photograph, um, with this incredible feeling that we were family. There's the half-Jewish bishop from South Africa with the ex-Hamas terrorist and, um, and the, American, the young American from Iowa who voted for Trump. All, <laughs> all, all sitting together on the bench. And of course, my experience with terrorists up to now has not been good. Uh, and here I am sitting next to one who's a brother. Now, how does that happen? You see, my friends, the world can't make this happen. But the gospel can. And it is the power of the gospel that puts those three people on the same couch together and in the same family together. And if Jesus can do that to an angry young Palestinian terrorist, how much more can he do it for you, for me? And change your heart, not just towards people who you hate, but maybe towards your neighbor who you just can't stand because he plays the music too loud at 11 o'clock at night. Or people that are just slightly different to you have moved in across the road and seem weird. If Jesus can change that man's heart, what's your excuse? What's my excuse?
And maybe God has put his finger on something here. Because it's, it's this kind of unity that shows the world that the gospel works. That the power of the gospel really does change lives, now and forever. And maybe God has even put his finger on your heart because your animosity towards others might just be exposing your animosity to God. And maybe that's what he's wanting to put his finger on here and now. Well, let's talk to him as we pray. Well, how we thank you that again and again, our Heavenly Father, we can come to your scriptures and see the depth and the extent of the Savior we have in Jesus. We will never stop seeing endless facets of this infinite grace. And Lord, how we grieve at the hostility that remains in our hearts because of our sin, and how we ask you to forgive us for that, to make us more people who love one another in such a way that we really show we are a family from every tongue and tribe and nation. And perhaps even someone here has seen the state of their heart relationship towards you and that hostility that ultimately needs to be removed. Perhaps you need to cry out to God even here now and say, it's you I need to be reconciled with God. And I cry out to Jesus for forgiveness and reconciliation. Our oh, Father, will you make us such a people that the world notices, not because we are divided, but because we love one another, because Jesus first loved us. Amen.